Hello, and welcome to Scurf Interviews podcast in our mini series on Dow Star One. Today, we are joined by Kia Krutler from Gnosis Guild and Michael Zargum from Block Science. And just to get us started, I'll pass it off to both of you for quick introductions. So, uh, Kia, do you mind getting us started? Sure, thanks so much. Hey, I'm Kia. Um, for the last four and a half years, I've worked at Gnosis, so across different product or protocol verticals in Web3. And just recently, I've co-founded Gnosis Guild, which is a small team that works on the Zodiac tools for DAOs and the Zodiac Open Standard. So the idea of a modular stack for DAO tooling um, that can connect different platforms and protocols together. I have a background in philosophy, and I've worked as an artist. Um, I really enjoy writing, and it's really been a pleasure to bring together all of my interests into the kind of what is now called the Web3 space, the emergent term. Uh, in the past, it was called many other things. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, Zargam, do you mind jumping in? Uh, sure. So um, I guess I've been working in the uh, now called Web3 space for, um, ooh, I guess I started hacking around in 2015, got more involved over the course of 20, 2016 and 17. Uh, I have a background in like large scale sort of resource allocation problems in, in infrastructures. I'm a, a control theory PhD with a focus on these kinds of uh, resource allocation problems. Um, did a little bit of work in industry. I founded Block Science in order to um, sort of bridge between my academic and sort of industry interests and really work on applied problems. Um, I've been lucky enough to sort of grow up a small community of people with similar perspective on research. And um, in addition to working on sort of a little bit of applied research and a little bit of basic research at Block Science, um, I'm also um, a core member at MetaGov. And so I, I worked on the uh, strike team that put together the uh, Dow Star Standard. And on that note, I just want to uh, ask the first question of what led both of you to being involved in Dow Star One and why you were excited for this initiative overall. So I don't know if either uh, which one of you would like to jump in first on that one. I guess I'm kind of a more recent addition to the community. I've been hovering around in the MetaGov Slack for quite some time. And I was brought there by the work of people like Primavera de Filippi, as well as Nathan Schneider, um, who've been publishing really excellent work at the kind of intersection of thinking through emergent and quite old governance forms and the kind of technological or protocol layers that underpin and have a feedback loop with them. Um, so the MetaGov research project was often the kind of nexus or the group publishing these works in recent years. And uh, I believe Dow Star One kind of emerged out of this research group to look towards um, formalizing some of the discussions, uh, both formalizing both on a technical and I think also in a kind of coalition manner, um, some of the discussions around really creating modular interoperable tech stacks. And I think uh, one of the works published by the group uh, called Modular Politics, um, so thinking through how you essentially have governance patterns embedded in different social platforms online and how they feed back into the real world, um, was super influential for me in thinking through how to position Zodiac mods, which are literally called mods or modulars, um, basically based in part on that paper. Um, so basically through hovering around this group and also my involvement in Gnosis over the years, it seemed a perfect alignment when Dow Star One emerged to be able to kind of contribute both my technical knowledge and experience in context. The most important thing about standards working groups is that you have teams that are actually practicing in the field to implement them. So I'm very happy to support on that level as well as on the thinking level there. <laughs> Absolutely. And what about you, Zargam? Um, well, interestingly, the, the Dow Star um, effort came, at least in part, out of the GovBase effort, which is another sort of sub-project inside of the um, MetaGov envelope or the like, sort of umbrella. We were trying to collect more data about how people actually do govern themselves in practice in DAOs and in, in other organizations. GovBase isn't just for DAOs. Um, and what we were starting to find is that you got answers like, I don't know. And you could do lots of scraping and still not really know. And so it turned out that um, you really can't expect an organization to do what a 
human or even a piece of software might do when you ask them, who are you? Like, what are you? Like, how, how are you constituted? And so, um, at least from my perspective, the difficulty in the collection and cleaning and maintaining of data in GovBase, even as we set up the technical infrastructure, invited this question of, well, you know, if an organization is a sort of living thing, what, what does it sort of mean to ask, like, who are you? Or to sort of meaningfully be able to maintain the capacity to answer at least some some basic um, again I'll call them constitutive questions. It's not quite identity. I like I mean in some ways we might think of it as identity, the the collective identity of the organization. But um, the the gist of it for me was that um, as we sort of built out that data set and started analyzing it, noticing that it was holy or noticing that it was um, sort of changing faster than we could um, necessarily update it without a much larger maintenance force than we had, um, it made it made sense to actually turn this into a, a, um, a different uh, architecture, one where uh, it was normal or even standardized for an organization that wanted to be participatory to have a, a kind of default means of saying, here's who I am or who we are in a sense, our members, our um, the types of activities and, and how we define ourselves. And we can get more into that later, but there's a real gap in the in the data actually. And this was an interesting way to get at least in my opinion, high fidelity, you know, representative data, which was maybe more in the in the words of the organization itself, rather than even us imposing upon it based on answering lots of questions and trying to like organize data into some ontology. And, and so follow up question on that in terms of uh, what you're kind of really excited about with Dow Star One and what problem do you see it solving uh, primarily? Of course, there will be multiple things over time. But I wonder, is uh, Zargon, from your perspective, is it that data perspective or, or do you see a different kind of core problem that Dow Star One is solving? Uh, so what's interesting here is that I think it will solve that problem, but I, I think that that's not necessarily the end goal. It's just that there's a shared um, issue there is that if an organization can't communicate who they are to a, a simple request, like, hey, like, you know, I'm asking you what 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 defines you? What's your purpose? Who are your members? How do you govern yourself? Then how do you expect people to be able to find it, join it, or to interact between inst like institution to institution relationships, this DAO to that DAO, or this DAO to this new potential member, or you know, this DAO to this more traditional institution, whatever those, you know, org level interactions are gonna be. Um, you really can't have them in a scalable, trustworthy way if you don't have some means of um, honestly not just answering, but answering in a trustworthy way, who are you? Yeah, it's such an interesting point. And uh, yeah, if time was not limited, I'd love to go on a much deeper dive into also, Kia, some of the work that y'all are doing on the DAO pattern languages side. And if you see any uh, interaction points between what Zargon was just mentioning and some of the, the goals of, of that project, um, but Zargon, I see you want to jump I, in. I can bridge that for you. I mean, honestly, Please. I think that this is super relevant. At the level of the DAO star standard, we were making a lot of work to, or doing a lot of work to make Space or hold space for a wide range of patterns. So that was actually what made the working group, the strike team, so hard was that we had people from a bunch of different um, DAO initiatives, specific DAOs, and from DAO frameworks. And because they aren't all the same, we needed to make it general enough that there's this whole expressive language inside of the standard, meaning things we couldn't even imagine could be expressed. And I, I see the, the pattern language as a, a way of sort of maybe beginning to explore the things that could be expressed. Um, anyway, so I don't know if that's helpful, but I'd love to hear about the pattern language. Please. Sure, sure. I can share a little bit about that, but also responding some, to some of the points brought up. I think it's really interesting kind of the question of will DAO star one solve the data problem? And recently in the kind of DAO space, I've been shifting towards more like um, rather than solving for a particular kind of outcome, really like how can we build resiliency in the context of the kind of outlying fields, right? And that's in part inspired by a lot of block sciences work. So I think there is this promise of DAOs being, I call them like mnemonic institutions, but basically institutions that have a public archival record of their actions almost in real time. 
and where you can choose kind of public private settings. So having something like the JSON like linked data format is really important. And as you said, kind of holding space for as many possibilities and permutations of what DAOs will be in the future, because I think that the patterns of them at the moment are really not set right now. So you have to basically have, I think it's really helpful to have kind of data schemas that you can almost recite or remember to some degree, or that get kind of so simple, but also so broad at the same time that they have the possibility to persist. Because just in the last kind of year or two, seeing how much the DAO landscape has changed means that it might even exponentially change further in the next couple of years. So we're kind of trying to hold the similar space and more of a social technical side on the pattern language front. So the rough idea of a pattern language is that it's like describing, um, let's call it an environment or an ecology through a series of discrete patterns that can be chained together through a language. So emerging originally from the, the field of architecture, the idea that um, having a sun facing outdoors and the light on two sides of every room. So combine these two patterns. Um, but basically being able to kind of do almost like a bottom up culturally specific vernacular for building environments or ecologies. Um, and that these are actually really replicable ways for information to carry on in a kind of cultural vernacular way. So we wanted to take and introduce this idea within the DAO space. It's already kind of um, percolated throughout the programming, different programming communities, particularly functional programming, but bringing it more to the DAO space in a wiki format where we can codify these kind of patterns, not only in data schemas, but in kind of a social or cultural or even a poetic language um, that feels really deeply embedded in practice, uh, because I think it's that mnemonic quality or that um, almost like the oral quality of patterns that is also as important as their kind of interoperability. I almost see the kind of Zodiac Wiki project, which is where the DAO pattern language will live as like a, a really necessary and supportive complement to DAO Star 1's technical standards. And, and just to give one example, it could be kind of like um, the pattern of often DAOs start with a multi-sig, but then the signers um, become a kind of bottleneck in the process, or you have to trust the signers to execute transactions. So one pattern, it could be called like a community sig, where you kind of implement a mod that allows anyone to execute those proposals and a kind of thing that if there is a treasury, the proposer should have access to execute on it. So these little discrete patterns within DAOs to be very concrete. So I think there's an interesting thing about the, the pattern languages is that um, one, they evoke the idea of primitives, which is a common term in the, in the Web3 space, but not often used, I think, you know, as it means semantically, like we often hear people describe things as primitives, but what they're actually talking about are, you know, higher order properties that they want, or like, you know, specific, you know, assemblages, as opposed to the primitives that you compose to create those assemblages. And in, in the examples that you've given, you're actually talking about actual functional primitives, things that you could, you know, put together and you get a wide range of different potential um, assemblages with different system level properties that maybe fit the complexity of the, the organization that they're serving. Um, but at the same time, um, what I like about the way that you described it is that some of those primitives are particular, let's call them like sub assemblages, two things together, but not necessarily the whole thing um, might actually um, become sufficiently common that they're quickly recognizable and that they carry forward. And people are like, oh yeah, like that that pairing works really well. Maybe we need it here. Um, and sort of starting to associate even specific, you know, pairings or um, certain choices of of primitive in in the governance perspective with certain cultures, like some groups of organizations that share certain values might be like opposed to having, you know, multi-seg based decision making. And so they use X and Y as a substitute for the following reason, but a different sort of subculture might feel very strongly that maybe they do prefer to have a multi-sig board-like structure and maybe they start to implement rules for um, effectively electing those boards similarly to the way that um, nonprofits do or, you know, dot, dot, dot. The, the idea here is not that any one of these um, you know, is right, but more that by expressing things in terms of uh, pattern languages, um, you start to get the idea that combinations of primitives within certain uh, organizations might be more a matter of those organizations' cultures, and you might actually get some recognition over which sort of subculture you're in quickly by just recognizing the pattern when you arrive, or maybe when you ask, "Who am I?" of the um, of the Dow Star standard. 
Yeah, and that just makes me wonder when it comes to, right, with Dow Star 1, if it's uh, in its most straightforward form, right, it's, it's trying to focus at least initially on technical specifications and standards. And so when when thinking through a project along those lines, and especially given what we were just chatting about, what are the important kind of cultural components of change relating to this that are necessary to factor in when trying to plan standardizing in an industry that isn't exactly rife with standardization, right? If this was kind of in traditional web two, there's been precedents, etc. I actually think this is one of the first bottom up uh, standardization efforts in the industry that's reaching a ton of organizations. And it's really exciting to see. So I, I would just be interested in hearing from your perspectives on, on what you think about that aspect. I think it's definitely like an uphill journey, especially in kind of such an emergent ecosystem to establish a standard. I think one of the things that <laughs> this is a little bit of um something I've been chiming in a little bit too often about recently is this idea that I, I think standardization and kind of having lack of bias and tooling also really depends on kind of like the culture around it. So you don't have something that presents as kind of like unbiased. It's all of these groups want to be able to use the standard to, or in order to interoperate, but also to establish and kind of confirm their own goals. And like really having a shared culture of interoperability is so important for this rather than imagining it's kind of some objective center. I, I think I'll leave it at that for the moment. I want to riff on that a little bit because it's also a point that I feel like I've had to make in very different language repeatedly. But as a, you know, engineer, mathematician type, I have often am in the role of defining, I'll call them models or representations, and that those representations then get sort of taken as a kind of ground truth on top of which other, you know, things are derived, built, composed, etc. And as a as an engineer, and in particular, someone with some, you know, cybernetics background, a little bit of applied control theory for um, uh, social systems, it's actually a kind of commonly called out risk factor is that you can't you can't treat yourself as outside of the system because your own biases your design choices your models that um you use to um design say a standard end up um implicit in the thing that you produced and you know not that that's not okay in the broad sense like everything has that property but being aware of it um you know the the cybernetics literature thinks of this in terms of second order cybernetics and the sort of more social science literature talks about the concept of reflexivity and i i kind of i'm deeply aware of the fact that we are potentially you know restructuring the field of action for others and that we're doing so in a way that um imprints and, and codifies our own perspectives or our own models of the world. Um, and to Kia's point, um, you know, there's a lot of benefit from being aware enough of that to A, sort of maybe mitigate some of the risks, but to B, design for things that are um, more expressive, they're self-adaptive, they're composable. What, what that ultimately means is that although we have imprinted some of our present view of the world on it, um, it has the remaining adaptive capacity to, to shift insofar as those assumptions you know, cease to be sufficient um, or are later identified as problematic for, for some reason that maybe we didn't know or wasn't even true at the time that um, they were originally produced. I think that's also important in basically having this kind of bottom up style pattern language, right? Or the way that Dow, Staff, or Dow Star One is approaching the patterns of looking at membership first, looking at proposals, um, basically discrete but overlapping components of what a Dow is, but not trying to start with an initial definition of a Dow. <laughs> because we already have really baked in assumptions of there are members, there are proposals. And given that this is such an emergent field, like those are actually huge assumptions. We could be thinking, much, much, much more strange about um, how all of these governance systems work. But at least having them as kind of little little patchworks that we put together, we don't delimit the potential too much. And we also increase the adaptability and the extent to which we'll embrace these biases very knowingly and reflexively. I think what's interesting about the choice, and I being having worked on the strike team, I can talk a little bit about how we honed in on what we chose to standardize versus what we didn't. Um, members and proposals effectively uh, allow us the minimum ontology required to differentiate between individual level behavior and organization level behavior. And so if you reason through what is an organization, not even worried about 
you know, decentralized autonomous and the sort of various definitions that people use for those uh, modifiers. Organization itself um, is, in a sense, a, um, a collective noun, and or arguably, I almost prefer it as a verb, right? Organization as the you know noun form of the verb to organize. We're, we're talking about um, the means by which or the ongoing activity of integrating individual behavior into sort of aggregate entity behavior. Um, and that is an interpretation. Certainly in the, in the strike team calls, we were just trying to hone in on, you know, what would be a, a descriptive representation that was sufficiently expressive to allow for lots of things in the future, but also constrained enough to be useful for, you know, program for software, right? At some point, you need to standardize something to write software. Um, but that that crux there is that, you know, we have a notion of, of individual actors, you know, potentially, you know, not just human, but, you know, other DAOs, computers, I mean, we might leave open the way that the uh, schemas might be extended to include different classes of actors. But ultimately, the notion of member is, you know, part, and the, the entity itself is whole, and that there's some machinery through which activities on the part of the parts manifest as activities of the whole, and sort of managing that, um, that leap in scale is, at least for me, the reason why some sort of standard standardization is important because we can't individually hold in our head uh, so many relationships, right? The, a sort of Dunbar's number or even, you know, you might imagine in the future an organizational Dunbar's number, like my DAO can only have so many relationships with so many other DAOs before my, you know, organization level um, sort of cap is met and I can't reason about or maintain relationships across those edges. I I'm rambling a bit, I apologize, but there's a lot here that I think could still be explored around, you know, the emergent sort of bottom up um, institutions that are DAOs, but then as an organization, um, it exhibits I won't say anthropomorphic because I actually kind of like to lean away from thinking of them like people, but they, it, they have um, entity level activities that are maybe not um, always needing to be defined um, as, as a, at the individual level. And I'll just make a quick bad pun because, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what uh, what uh, Dalbar's number might look like, right? Just adjusting that for what does that network size uh, look like in uh, in DAOs. But yeah, sorry, bad pun aside, Kia. I always wonder though, how proven is Dunbar's number? And this is something I always ask myself, along with Maslow's hierarchy. But we don't need to digress there. But it gave me an interesting thought of like, because um, I'm remembering the kind of. Um, real energy that was behind projects of the semantic web. So now I'm thinking through like, was the semantic web or almost like um, DAOs as semantic organizations, are they actually tools for like associational management? Like the degree to which um, your ability to associate beyond a given uh, hop in the network collapses. So we need uh, organizations to manage those associations or somehow kind of organize them or keep them connected. That's where I was uh, going. <laughs> That's interesting. I think to your question about how proven is Dunbar's number, I don't know that the number is proven. I, I've observed that people have very different capacity constraints, but I think it's fundamental that people have a f capacity constraints. Like attention is a is not an infinite resource. It takes attention to maintain relationships. Um, it takes uh, a kind of cognitive load to sort of operate in good faith within those relationships. It's sort of a, a a restatement of the same point, but in even in a, a computational setting, you know, we're talking about computation requirements, limitations, and so, um, you know, I think the concept appears in their economic constraints when or their economic concepts related to this. Um, when people are reasoning in games, you have things like K levels, but you also have bounded rationality. So I think, in fact, the phenomena appears in different fields, um, and that ultimately it reflects. Uh, the fact that the, the the cycles in your head that you need to um, you know build and maintain relationships uh, use resources that are constrained, and that ultimately you can allocate those in different ways, but you you nobody has an infinite supply of the attention resource required to maintain relationships. So uh, the numbers may vary, and we might use institutional technologies to scale it, but but ultimately um, we're not going to get away from a, an upper bound on um, the sort of 
I guess, mass of relationship that we can manage. And I, I say mass because I think that people distribute it differently. Like I have a strong preference for smaller numbers of like more involved relationships. And I get kind of frustrated and frazzled with lots of like, um, like low touch relationships. Um, but other people do really well with lots of relatively low touch relationships. And so I sort of imagine they're still using the same, you know, social resource, um, but they've just chosen to allocate it differently. Totally. And I wasn't necessarily meaning to overly call out the signs of it, even though that's explicitly what I said, but I always think of Dunbar's number um, kind of like a very sticky piece of information. Like it's a very useful lens through which we can understand our interactions and understand like the limits and thresholds of organizations and, and social organisms. So I always think like what, what made Dunbar's number so sticky? And I often think in the context of DAOs, like what, what makes um, certain ideas about, you know, decentralized technology so stickily relate to kind of decentralized social processes? It's, it's just one of those long historical examples of um, an idea that just persists very well across um, different conversations. I have the instinct that it feels right. I know it's sort of silly. We talk about people, things that buy it, but the truth is that some of the most important ideas that stick, stick because um, they are good representations of phenomena that people feel are true. And, I, you know, there's some really dangerous things that happen when things feel true and aren't true. I, I've sort of made some jokes about this with regards to at least American politics, where I sometimes feel like some of the most um, dangerous attack vectors and the the misinformation in media space is when memes or ideas that feel true that are not just not true but are problematically not true are, are pushed but you know setting aside the sort of quadrant of what I'm going to refer to as the Colbert axis so the Colbert axis is you know, true, not true, feels true, doesn't feel true. And so if we focus on the feels true is true, I think that there's a lot of knowledge in that quadrant. And in a way, you're kind of poking at the fact that there's some really important ideas that, you know, feel true. And then I guess, you know, I would argue are also are true. Maybe we could say it's somewhat subjective. We don't, we don't need to get into the full details of what is true. But, you know, in a sense, a scientific sense, um, there are things that, you um, are, are, are not true up to some assumptions. Um, and I have felt like the things that are really sticky, the, um, the truths that uh, persist even um, in this sort of social way um, are the ones in that upper right-hand quadrant that they both are true and they feel true. Um, yeah. Again, I'm really rambly today. I apologize. <laughs> no, that makes sense. And that, that feels like a very home-like articulation and something to strive toward in our pursuits. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's interesting to think about some of the, you know, what, what you were also alluding to with Maslow's hierarchy as well as Dunbar's number. I feel like uh, what the research fully says about both of those versus what's usually reduced in like a TED talk or in a headline somewhere is also overly reductionist and uh, misconstrues some of the complexity of those things. And, you know, I think Zargon, what you were alluding to with, uh, you know, individual just preferences and differences around certain people do better at a deep and less number, lower volume, whereas others prefer more superficial and much higher number. So I think even on the Dunbar's number research, it can range from 50 to the to just over a thousand in certain communities where it still works well. Um, but yeah, it's so interesting to think about uh, what are some of the primitives that we need to be thinking about and developing both, I guess, to, to follow on on the other topics that we were talking about that we need to develop to enable the culture change to then make uh, us working together as a collective and doing things bottom up even possible in the first place. Because, um, yeah, that's that's an area where conceptually things can seem sound. And then when you get into the uh, inevitable messiness of human interaction, it can feel very, very different. Well, there's a concept um, that I, I comes from Ostrom related to matching the complexity of an organization to the complexity of the environment that it operates in. And I think there's a tendency for us to forget that in very computationally mediated settings because we're writing code and we sort of think that we can declare things. And, and the truth is that most of the environment that we're adapting to is, is the social part of the system and the the technical part is just scaling tools it's facilitation it's it's providing some you know trustworthy code base rule set that we can sort of act within and you know also generally the tools to adapt those rules um, but 
we're actually not you know building the technology for its own sake or we we shouldn't be we're, we're building it to facilitate the social system and the complexity of that the complexity of the problems being solved or activities being undertaken by the humans are what necessitates more or less complexity and in particular areas having more or less complexity for the the technology for, or even just for the organization structure and that matching is something that i think fits with the pattern language idea because the it, the patterns you exhibit depend on what you're doing not based on like what's right in some global sense and and i think also kind of coming at that same question or problem from a different angle, um, we sometimes lose sight of um, in kind of building systems for DAO governance, implementing them, interacting with them. We sometimes lose sight that governance is not the end goal of governance. Um, and sometimes kind of like over-engineer these systems. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't go the full way where good governance should be unseen, like good infrastructure. Like I think there's a there's a kind of happy medium and depends on context, the degree to which you have to participate in participatory systems. Um, but still sometimes we use this kind of almost like protocol or governance fetishism to, to kind of um, curtail uh, what we're actually looking to achieve, which is kind of commons facilitation or resource allocation or just um, living well <laughs> to a certain extent. Um, and I think that that's really important when we think about kind of social overlaying. Um, and we'll, we often think of social overlaying of technical processes, but I think it's if it has to be a figure and ground relationship, it would actually be reversed. So often when um, I people are talking about creating different DAO patterns or even in, for the DAO Star One group, we were discussing about how to do internal decision making and how to show buy-in for some of the standards, but also how to onboard people to the group. And there was a question of, um, should we formalize this on chain? And um, I think it, in the small group we were in, it was kind of unanimous that no, we should not do this yet because we have to test out this pattern. We have to see what feels natural and natural, what works, what doesn't. And that's why I often recommend kind of small groups that want to start a DAO. Firstly, I say why. And secondly, um, like what do you want to decentralize? And, you know, let's have like a, a real kind of pointed conversation about this in a, in a very supportive way. <laughs> and um, but secondly, also, like, have you tried it with Lumio or other types of software that um, maybe have really open patterns that have been used by groups for many, many years now, but just have um, less opinionated uh, decision making functions in them. Like I used to love with uh, using Lumio, which is open source writing software by Inspiral, was that um, you could have a discussion about a proposal and there would be an outcome and it would be kind of thumbs up, abstain, you know, typical choices. Um, but it wouldn't tell you on the interface whether the proposal had passed or not. All of those things like quorums or the parameters of governance were very much open for you to set as an organization. And as we move more and more towards uh, kind of mnemonic institutions or things that uh, kind of have these votes on chain, whether public or private, uh, that discrepancy in parameter setting or that kind of automation of uh, parameter and outcome um, closes, the, the gap between that closes. So it's really important to have these social patterns um, and the afford affordances they allow um, in place first, because otherwise we end up with a kind of endless governance stacked on governance, which is not the, the point of uh, living. So what's really funny, I, I really enjoyed talking with you because you just described a bunch of things in completely different words than I would have, but that I feel like I find myself needing to explain frequently. And I approach them from very much a signal processing and controls perspective because of my background. But I will sort of summarize some of the same topics in, I think, a completely different vernacular. So the first thing is that your point about governance and its own its own for its own sake versus you know pursuing purpose in a, like a sort of cybernetic style literature we're talking about viability versus purpose and sort of viability is the aspect of you know how the organization um, maintains itself and in this case governance is is the thing that's appropriate to map there but ultimately you're remaining viable in order to continue to pursue your function or purpose. And so if the governance sort of becomes the only thing that everyone's talking about or thinking about, that is at the cost of um, the energy, the time, the resources, the attention um, to pursue the the, the function, which is the, the stated purpose of the organization, or maybe it's an evolving purpose if it's a creative or artistic entity. Um, it may be that it has to discover for itself through its governance processes what it is that it's pursuing at any given time. But ultimately, we retain this notion of um, 
purpose and viability. Um, and I, I've been working on a paper with um, Kelsey Nabin, which goes over some of this stuff. Um, but the other aspect that you talked about in terms of the the, the various stages in the decision making process being broken down, um, for starters, in a sort of I'll use a materials analogy briefly. You know, when you put something on a blockchain, you're essentially casting it in stone. You can discard it, but you can't change it, or the extent to which you change it is quite minimal. And working with clay or something is far more appropriate if you don't need the load-bearing aspects of the stone. And if you, in fact, need the mutability of the clay because you're still figuring out what shape you need the thing to be to, to hold whatever you need to hold. But as you move further into the sort of more formal sort of mathy signal processing stuff, even the breakdown that you provided, like the difference between the individual's interactions that produces the data by abstaining or voting yes or whatever um, versus the accumulation accumulation of that data into some sort of, um, you know, let's say estimation of the state of the preferences of the group, converting that into a decision like an outcome, you know, then like sort of acting on that outcome. These separate stages are going from basically sensors to estimators to decision making to the actuation or the out the outcome predicated on the decision making. Like when you actually break down a, a decision system in its like formal sense, the way that you would you know, design and, and test and deploy and maintain, you know, formal uh, decision-making software systems in the sort of AI controls world, you have to break those parts down. You have to modularize them. You have to be aware of the fact that the right answer is going to be highly contextual. You you can't like design and then copy paste a, a, a decision-making system. In fact, you're almost always having to modularize it quite a lot because, um, because so much of the assumptions baked in any one of those components depend on the very specific system that you're trying to engineer. And furthermore, you know, if you're having to maintain or govern that thing, you may also have to retune, tweak, update, swap out those components. And so, um, you know, as much as that's a super technical nerdy way of describing it, I, I think it's actually really telling that the conclusion of that analysis is pretty much the same as yours with regards to using the right tools for the situation, and being able to um, you know, identify the specific um, way in which the information was collected as distinct from the way in which it is uh, rendered a, uh, a decision and the decision is turned into action. Yeah, and I think coming back to, as, uh, as we're unfortunately getting close to the end of our time together today, I just wanted to come back to somewhat what you're alluding to now, as well as the, that we've touched on throughout, which is uh, these terms of emergent of modularized and of standards. Because I, I feel like depending on who's looking at this and from what prism, there can be different amounts of tensions that exist between some of these terms. And at the same time, I think it, given Web3 ethos and just especially knowing how Dow Star One has evolved, it's very interestingly sort of embodying these three. But the specific question I want to ask you to, uh, as both folks who have been in, uh, in the Web3 space for quite some time and been active practitioners and researchers, do you, do you actually see any tension points of, say, modularized standards? Is that slightly oxymoronic, or does that just create a more challenging um, landscape of actually developing the standard because it needs to be more robust or more resilient in a variety of environments as opposed to just thinking, how do we connect A to B so that they can communicate, and that's that? I think it depends on where you draw those boundaries of how discrete and modular are we actually making the standards that we've supported so far because you could say that there's like a base layer technical infrastructure kind of I guess they're trying to be relatively agnostic as data schemas but you could say you have the EVM um, so I think that's it's a matter of perspective to that degree I think definitely as we found working with the Zodiac DAO tooling of uh, being able to work specifically in concrete once again patterns um, it, it's much easier to kind of combine them. So I could see a kind of standard, almost like prefab house <laughs> format for a combination of different patterns put together. Um, but I don't think, and maybe, you know, if if these patterns or these governance tools uh, last longer than we expect, um, it could be that standards emerge that are combinations of these modular discrete ones that were made, you know, decades prior. Um, and and then there's this, uh, <laughs> this is a little bit tangential, but I'm thinking of this Bateson quote um, kind of related to this. So if like the, the very modularized uh, components of standards today are the kind of building blocks of larger standards tomorrow or forgotten, um, Bateson had this quote in thinking about urban planning um, and coming to this kind of like moral horror of um, 
should like central planners essentially try to um, incentivize the behavior that they want to see in the, um, or incentivize, or let's say, should central planners create the kind of, or try to create, in my opinion, it's kind of a failed project, but try to create the kind of moral quality that would allow kind of incentives for the good to occur? Or should they try to create incentives um, for the good to happen later in the future without having any moral quality or justification related to them? You could say that this is a kind of confusion of terms of good, morality, incentives, temporality. But if you take the statement at face value, I think that that's also a problem that you face in um, standardization or any form of kind of trying to do whether central or more decentralized planning. Um, so the, the answer is, I don't know. I, I, I will riff on that, but I'll try to go back to the Dow Star standard specifically. We ran into concrete tensions between uh, whether the standard was actually going to be for the Ethereum community or whether it was going to be broader and like how much broader. Um, we certainly approached it from the perspective that we wanted the definition to be um, as uh, as inclusive as possible to not necessarily be restricted to Ethereum or even necessarily be restricted to um, blockchains. Actually, you know, as we currently articulated the the widest interpretation of the standard, it's implementable in Git basically um, because you could define the um, uh, define all of the processes and rules through which something was proposed and ultimately passed as Git flows or Git workflows, um, and you know at, you still have the notion of individual actors and sort of individual level behavior and organization level behavior and the articulation of the rules through which um, individual level behavior is aggregated into entity level behavior. Um, but obviously, that would be a little bit too vague. It doesn't provide the you know the machinery to go implement or to go um, to go adhere, um, at least not uh, in the near term. Um, we emphasized um, the Ethereum context for the EIP submission, um, and then we we're sort of generalizing it to cover more more topics. Um, we may be doing a POC with the um, with some folks from GitHub actually to see whether we can get something. Uh, equivalent to the standard, but implemented using um, uh, the GitHub organizations and the infrastructure for Git that they provide, um, and obviously, but you know, ideally, other Git-style organizations. Should we succeed in adequately generalizing it? But the reason why I think this is an interesting place to, to dig in on this question is that, on the one hand, the standard that we came up with was relatively narrow in that we um, you know we're talking about EVMs and we're talking about ethereum addresses and we're talking about you know smart contracts on the other hand though the ontology that we defined is quite quite open as long as you are saying that there exists members and members are you know unit you know individual level entities are, are you know part level entities then they can have any um, JSON LD style context that gets extended so you could go from having you know ethereum addresses to ethereum addresses and you know github IDs to ethereum addresses and you know gnosis chain IDs that are also kind of the same private key public key pairs as ethereum addresses but maybe Maybe you have to keep track of which chain ID it is, or maybe you're talking about, you know, dot, 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 maybe whole organization context entities or organization, you know, and a specific type of organization. And, and again, like all these dot, dot, dots appear precisely because um, by taking a sort of JSON LD approach, you have these context decorators. And so new whole classes of entity can be built up on top of the existing ontology to express like all sorts of stuff that was not actually, um, you know, even considered yet. Like obviously we had lots of ideas. I'm throwing out some, some dis points from discussions about the kinds of contexts that might emerge for um, from the member specific element. But the truth is that any of the elements that has a JSON LD schema has the capacity for sort of new classes to extend on the existing ones and for new details to be provided or um, new ways of combining those details to be uh, to be manifest. And the tricky part for us was that we had to sort of stick to Ethereum to start because our sort of review body was the the, the, the committee that, that reviews the, the EIPs. But we didn't want it to be like stuck in, you know, Ethereum only world. So we still designed it with requirements that, um, 
allow us to like lift it up into something a bit more general. The hope is that the standard or at least the sort of meta standard that could be lifted out of the the, um, the EIP would be um, kind of in deep enough synergy with the real phenomena of organization that some variant of it, something with its sort of intellectual DNA would persist over, over the long haul. Even if it's not in the exact form that we specified it, we did aim to specify it with some like very intentionally with some adaptive capacity. Yeah, no, thank you for the added color. And I just want to thank you both for joining today because I know we're about to hit time. So yeah, I just uh, appreciate you both taking the time to generally share your views uh, and to fill us in on some more of the uh, exciting activities pertaining to Dow Star One.